Hi, and welcome to our Q&A today with Steve Ryder from CPO. We're going to talk about what Steve does, what his organisation does and the difference they make in their community. Hi, Steve. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome. Um, Thank you. Go. Okay, so uh, my name is Stephen Ryder. Um, uh, as, as, as Emma's just said, um, I run a social enterprise based in Grimsby called CPO. Um, We've traded on various uh, different names, but at the moment, CPO is creating positive opportunity. Um, and that sort of reflects the work we do as an organization as a, as a whole. Um, there's two projects I want to uh, mention specifically um, for the purpose of this call. One's the Grimsby Full Families Project. Uh, that's a project which is funded by the National Lottery Community Fund, uh, Reaching Communities Partnership uh, Stream. Uh, we run that with another uh, charity who work locally. Um, and that project really is to offer full family wraparound support, literally working with, with children of any ages and adults of, of any ages. Um, the, the ethos and the, the genesis of the project came about because we run a number of uh, projects in Northeast Lincolnshire uh, and Humber wide where we're working with uh, different age groups, for example, uh, young unemployed adults on a needs project, um, long-term unemployability projects for, for adults over the age of 25, health and wellbeing initiatives, um, online initiatives, making people more digital, digitally ready. Um, and we discovered over a period of time that often we were dealing with, with members of the same family, but we were dealing with them separately, so working in silos. Uh, which seemed non nonsensical really, because I think with a lot of the things that we, we're hearing through this project, and unless you go to the root of a, pro a problem and find out why perhaps uh, a child isn't attending school or an adult hasn't been at work uh, for a long period of time, if you don't know what those causes are, uh, actually any fix will be short term, it'll be temporary. And as soon as you take the stabilizers off the bike, those people will be back where they were uh, having fallen over. So what we tried to do was to offer a, a program which looked at issues that might be affecting a family, uh, not just negative ones, uh, but looking at positives, looking at how we can harness positive uh, experiences and help that help use those to overcome uh, the negatives. So there was a pilot run uh, locally for a short period of time, just on one housing estate. Um, with some really positive results and we sold that to the lottery uh, and it developed into a three-year project which finished in December and we've just had renewal funding so it will be running for the next three years. Great news. Wonderful and in regards to the projects that, um, that you're currently doing, you, you were saying there about working with another organisation, how important do you think it is for organisations to collaborate with other local groups? To yeah, I think it's essential. Um, I think the danger of the uh, voluntary community social enterprise sector is that often we're at the whim of funding applications. And it's very easy to overpromise to say that you know one organization's all things to all people and, that, and that's absolutely not the case so i think through collaboration you can you can place your own strengths of an organization where you need additional support you partner up with organizations that that can do that which is you know very similar to this project really that, that we're all going to bring our strengths to bear which will benefit people in in the long run so yeah partnership work and collaboration really important and not just within the sector. I mean, the stakeholders on the Grimsby Full Families Programme, unsurprisingly, are our local authority children's services, uh, our CCG, Humberside Police, NSPCC, and the DWP. So by, by bringing them into the actual project, but by us bringing them into the project, we offer that you know, real wraparound support. So we're not expecting families to go and find things on their own, but we work with those partners. So, you know, it's something as basic as a, a problem with a universal credit application. We'll, it, we, we will advocate, but we'll also handhold and make sure that when an adult goes to those meetings with a job coach or whoever it may be, that they understand everything that they've been told, that they're getting real genuine person-centered support uh, to overcome those problems and and by us partnering up with with children's services and the police it tends to open the doors i think for families because often people are very reticent about 
admitting that they've got a problem or going for help because they feel they're going to be judged or what if they find out about something I've done previously? Is that going to be a problem? I'll stay away from the police or I'll stay away from children's services. Whereas we find that because we've got very good relationships with those organisations and we do that hand-holding, that it takes the pressure off the families, they go with a more positive mindset and actually they will find that some of these organisations, if not all, are genuinely there to help and they're not a threat, uh, they're not adversarial. Um, so it's worked really well. So I think it is about partnering up within our own sector, but that cross-sector partnership is really important as well. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think it helps as well when you've got support as a professional with a family that can transfer information across to those services that maybe families may not say, but transfer it across in a way that the services understand that they need to support with. And yeah helps break that barrier from the services perspective of things, you know, maybe a professional advising somebody yeah. in statutory services that you kind of need to, you know, tone it down a little bit, or you need to approach this delicately, or they're really anxious about this particular subject. And having somebody there to advocate that information across is always really helpful. How often do you come across families where there's potentially unidentified needs. So you, so you say that you work with a lot of um, young people who are yeah. um, out of education or out of employment as they as they get to adulthood. How many of those do you come across where you think that there's been definitely some unidentified need there? And how important is it, do you think that there are services involved to educate others on, on how to identify need? Yeah, I think it's um, more often than not. I mean, if I was going to pluck a figure out of the air, I'd say 60% plus of the families and the young people that we work with that we, we don't know. And, and indeed, the other services who are involved don't know what the real story is. And that's often the first piece of work is to identify what the problem is, how it's been perceived, but actually what's causing that. And often it is something that's not been, uh, you know, it could be... Um, it could be trauma, uninformed trauma, where people have, have experienced something previously and that they've buried that, they've become, you know, the, you know, a lot of our families live in denial, possibly because of the things that they, they feel that they're gonna be judged on. But especially with young people, I mean, we, do, we attend a lot of school meetings, um, especially around special educational needs. Um, you know, undiagnosed autism is one that we deal with quite often. Um, and you know you can see that there's a, a frustration often between family, child, and school. And whilst everybody is probably aiming in the right direction and they want a positive outcome, because the communication around things where often there is complex vocabulary, the way in which these things are assessed, they seem to be quite difficult. Um, that some of the language is, it, it, you know, is acronym heavy, jargonized. I think just going with being a support, but being professional at the same time, it's almost like uh, an interpretation service sometimes where you're helping somebody who knows their child, but perhaps has a frustration about why that child's not succeeding, not engaging, not socializing or mixing properly by actually going and working through with the other professionals and making sure they do get the right support, whether that's just, um, soft skill support or whether it is something more complicated like going you know going to a cam service and making sure that if a diagnosis is needed that we look at that and then we we know what to do with that going forward um you know we were uh, i was in an access pathway meeting two weeks ago with one of our delivery officers and actually the outcome wasn't the outcome the parent was hoping for but because myself and the head teacher at the school were absolutely adamant that, that the offer support was right, I feel if it had just been the head teacher telling the parent, there would have been a, a level of resistance to that. But because she trusts us and she trusts our service, and I said, no, I think on this occasion, you know, um, C, let's call him that, is getting exactly the right kind of support. He is achieving well. There are some low level concerns we've got. Let's focus on those and, and take it forward. And I, I feel that it was, it was myself and the delivery officer who've been supporting this family for two years because they trust us, even if they don't trust the school sometimes, but because they trust us, they accepted the decision of the, the, the access pathway, whereas I don't think they would have done before. So 
that allows that family to move on. I think otherwise they'd be sat in a place of resistance where they'd have been fighting the school continually. Now they've actually said, okay, it's not what we thought. It might not be what we hoped for, but we can see that the support's there. We're all on the same page and we're moving forward. So I think that's really important that there's that supportive yet professional voice that runs alongside the other services that are often involved with the family. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just to ask what, what advice you would give really, because a, a lot of the time, the families that we work with, we come across where trauma has set in due to unmet needs, yeah. uh, where, you know, a, ch a child has kind of gone through school and not been understood and not been supported and adjustments not being in place yeah. because of the lack of understanding around the education system in regards to SEND, other than kind of your key players yeah. who do. Um, and then trauma sets in and then what you start to see towards the later years is, is you know, adverse behaviours as a result yeah. of trauma that yeah. starts to come out. What advice would you give to professionals um, on how to identify that and also maybe to family members on how to address that with school and how to, you know, create that awareness because it's not something that schools usually look at? Yeah, I think that there's a, there's a couple of things. One is... Um, something that I fundamentally believe that, that no child is, is born bad, uh, absolutely not. Um, and I think that sometimes we try to overdiagnose poor behavior, that it's got to be something else. Um, you know, I think it is about going back and trying to understand that child. And, 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 and we find, I mean, the, the frustration that we have is that our, our project, our, our youngest education project, 16, and often we get young people who've come out of alternative education provision proves they're miles behind with their education. They come to us and for the first time, often they feel that somebody's listening to them, that they're being understood and they start to achieve, which is wonderful for our project. And it's great for the kids at that time. But my frustration is, is a lot of these things could have been prevented at a much earlier age. I think there's a, I think that we have a real fear of um, spending the right amount of time actually listening, that two ears, one mouth approach to communication. Um, you know, give the child a chance, give the parent a chance to share the frustrations. What are causing issues? What, what does, what does the kind of, um, breakdown in that family unit or in the engagement with school what does it look like um you know we we work very closely uh, as a team within this building um so low level mental health support is offered through our service um we are we do a lot of work about uh, improving self-esteem confidence building um but I think sometimes you've got to accept that actually there needs to be a le another level of professional support and something that we're really positive about now. And I think the stigma has started to fall away is that sometimes getting professional therapy and counselling for young people, and I'm talking very young people, so Kudox, who you know that we work with at the moment, I think they've got a number of children under the age of five that they're working with. Now, whilst it breaks my heart that that's the situation that they're in, that child stands a far better chance of progressing through primary and secondary school than some of the, the people that we're working with now who are 22, 23, still having um, not come to terms with trauma earlier in their lives, still having those barriers created by that trauma, not because they're difficult, not because they're bad, not because they're naughty, but because they haven't learned how to engage with normal society. And there's nearly always an, an issue, you know, and, and often the issue is in the household. And again, it's very easy. And we live in this blame culture that there's bad parents and that parents didn't spend enough time with their children. But actually, if you break down the, the social situation in any household and you look, look at the pressures that are being uh, brought to bear, you know, mum's got two jobs so she's not at home very often. The child becomes a latchkey child. Issues start to develop. Now, you know, what we, do, what we do is we take that away. We look at, okay, so mum's having to work all of these hours. Mum's on her own. There's two children at home. You know, what are the alternatives for that? How can we actually fill in the gaps? Rather than pointing the finger and saying to mum, you've got to do it this way or that way, what support can we offer? 
where can we help? What projects are we running? I mean, one of the reasons our Children in Need project that we run here is very much an after school style uh, organization with holiday activities and things is that we knew that a lot of, of children either were going home after school at 3, 3.30 and being on their own or even worse, because they knew they were going to be on their own, they weren't going home and they were mixing with people that they shouldn't. So that's the that's where we come from. You know, let's put something positive in place rather than concentrating on negatives. Let's stop pointing the fingers and let, let's support. You know, all of the projects we run, they've all got a start and an end, you know, somebody's paying for them somewhere. But actually, the support that we offer as, as an organization has no start point and no, an end point. What we try and do is build up resilience within families, give them that the ability to cope without the level of support that we offer. When they're ready to be independent, we allow them to be independent. But we stay in the background and we can come back to the foreground if we need to. Um, and we try and tie everything else in. You know, if we're developing projects a, a little bit like this one, we, we look at where it fits in with ourselves as an organization so you know we've got children's activities program from the age of five upwards we've got a traineeship program for 16 to 24 year olds we've got an employability project for 25 to 65 year olds with a whole load of social uh, and emotional support wrapped around it and lots of things like digital inclusion and those projects haven't just been developed because we've got we'll have a bit of that and we'll have a bit of this it's developed because we look at the needs of the people that we're working with and we feel that as a sing single agency, if we can offer as much support as possible, then that makes it easier for parents and children. You know, I'm sure that you find in your organization that you'll have family members who are involved with six or seven different agencies. I bet it's a full time job just getting the support. Now, what I said earlier in the call is, we're involved with all of those agencies, but they have a single support worker with a buddy so that that person always has support, even if somebody's off sick or on holiday or anything else, they'll have a single support worker, we call them delivery officers, and that delivery officer does the signposting, the handholding and the advocacy so that it doesn't become overwhelming just asking for help. And I mean, just think about that. Why should it, all, why should it ever be overwhelming to ask somebody for help? help is something that we should be providing and it should be something that that we do to make things easier for families and for children um not to make things harder but often people are saying it's too hard to access that so that's why we come in and help yeah and it's very much like the old old school way of everybody helping everybody yeah. and it taking a village to raise a child and it's about yeah. reinstating that and I think what we're finding is a lot of community organisations are doing that now um, on, on their own back. Whereas, you know, many years ago, sort of over a decade ago, under a different um, um, parliamentary group, should we say, it, it was very much that that was there and, and alive. Whereas the, the last de decade, that's kind of disappeared. And I definitely think that there's a there's a politics you know re a political reason for that unfortunately um but what's really great is although that has been reduced what we are seeing is a very um reinstill re of community and organizations people building organizations yeah. around as grassroots to put what's missing back into the community for people who need that support Absolutely. I think it's really important that, that any project like the one that we're, we're working on together now, the ones that you're running, the ones that we're running, that there's always there's always legacy, you know, in an ideal world. If you think that we're we effectively offer, if I can try and boil it down really, really quickly, community social work and really employment services in an ideal world, if we're really good at our job, we'd all be redundant very quickly because we'd solve all of those problems. We wouldn't need to be here to offer that support. But I think that the, the legacy of, of the programs that we run should be leaving communities behind that support each other. So one of the things that we built into the second stage of, of this lottery project is where we go into communities and we see specific issues that we give communities individual members but communities the skills to actually start delivering their own services so 
families supporting each other, communities supporting each other, you know, young peer educators, you know, it's great to see people who are sort of 15, 16, we're just about to start a, a, a peer education or peer support uh, program around our children in need where those children who were less confident two or three years ago, who are now more confident, more outgoing, they're gonna devise ways to support people who are like themselves. Um, that's just about to start. That sort of level of support where we can just stand back and say, we're here to sort of, you know, give you a little bit of advice if you need it. But if we can get people within community supporting each other, and, and I think you're absolutely right, Emma, that, that old fashioned family support where if you knew that somebody three doors up was having a bad time, you were around there, you know, it might've been a cup of sugar. It might've been, you know, just going around for a, a nap around the kitchen table. But I think if we can get back to that, and you know, I think, you know, ironically, um, I think the pandemic has brought a lot of that out in the communities that, that we're s supporting. So we've done a lot of emergency support, partly because of the kind of organization we are. And people that we were supporting in say April, May last year, who really needed a lot, a lot of support, very, very concerned about going out, even to a shop, especially to a supermarket. They're now actually confident enough to, act, to go out and shop for others. And they're doing that because they felt that an organization like ours was able to give them something and they now want to give something back. They're not being paid for that. They're doing it because they feel that they're part of a community that has supported each other for unfortunately a very long time now. And I think that's just a microcosm of what we want to see happening. You know, not just in Grimsby, I mean, Grimsby for families, it, it, we wanted to give it a geographical name, but the reach is much broader. Um, certainly working with the lottery, we want to make sure that the learning that we have from programs like this is shared nationally, um, certainly to other lottery projects across the country. And I think for me, you know, we'll have done a great job if in three or four years time, we'll stand back, come out of these, you know, in inverted commas, deprived communities. We can come away from there and watch people on the ground supporting each other with a bit of help when it's needed then I think that's what success looks like. It's not about me filling in a monit monitoring form to say we've worked with X number of families. This many people were drug dependent. This many people were alcoholics. This many people were at risk of having their children taken off them. Yeah, we can all do graphs and bar charts and everything else, but I think real success is communities and, and communities are made up of families. So real success is families supporting families and having the tools to do it properly. And that's what we feel our, our role is, is to give them the tools. We work with people. We never, ever do things to people. They've had enough of that. We've all seen what happens when, you know, big society decides you're not good enough. You're not fit to do X and Y. You shouldn't be looking after this child. So we're going to do this to you. That never works. We also don't do things for people because if you end up doing things for, for people all the time, they never learn to do it themselves. So as I say, we do things with people for as long as those people need us to do things with them. And then when they can do things without us, then they'll do it on their own. And if they can help other people to learn that, then that's utopia in my book. You touched on it briefly before, Steve, about um, so the reach being much wider. So uh, it's, the service sounds, yeah. amazing, you know, for, for, for so I'm wondering if a family was sat there and it was a Grimsby family and they're thinking, actually, we'd really like to get in touch. What's the best way to do that? And does it have to be somebody within a Grimsby postcode? And is there any other support that could be offered to families outside, you know, in terms of tapping into some of the other projects you're doing? Might be a no, but just for anyone watching, I thought I'd ask that question. Yeah, no, I think it's a really good question, Meg. Um, I, I guess, strictly speaking, the, the project is a North East Lincolnshire project, um, but we have a very good relationship with our funders. So two things can happen. One is there is always leeway. So if people can uh, engage with us, but they're not in that postcode, absolutely they can. But secondly, and you know, Emma talked about this earlier, is we work with a number of partner organizations. You know, so for example, our partner organization on this, they're actually a whole based charity delivering in, in, in Grimsby, but they have a very similar project based around the one that we're running in both Hull, uh, I think one in Scunthorpe as well. So it, I, I'd like to think the reach is humble wide, 
Um, the other projects that we run, the vast majority of them actually commissioned through a humble wide agency. So if we can't do the delivery, we can always signpost to a, an organization that might be slightly closer to where that family or where that person's living. Um, as far as, as getting in touch, um, I, I know our details are, are on the website, um, but if you just look up um, my CPO, uh, Grimsby, um, you know, all of our projects are on our website. There's a, a, a nice video of me telling everybody how good we are. <laughs> um, but there's also some footage around some of the, you know, I think one of the, the nicest thing on our website is uh, the three year documentary we did about our children need project. And you can see that we try as far as possible to fo focus on the voices of the people themselves. So I can't promise that everybody out there across the whole country could access our, our our pro project. That said, I've been doing this a long time now. Um, and if I don't know, I will know somebody who does. Yeah. Um, so even if it's somebody, you know, down in Cornwall, I'm sure three or four phone calls between me, um, a project officer at the lottery or children on, in need on some of our employability stuff, I'm sure we could do that. And I'd be more than happy to do that signposting for anybody who got in touch with us. Brilliant. Thank you, Steve. That's great. Oh, wonderful. And I think it's been really helpful, just everything that you're talking about that families, I think, will definitely identify with, um, especially families that have autistic children yeah. and the struggles that they have with services, not understanding what they've been through and what they're going through. And I think just giving them um, a bit of hope about the, there being organisations like yours out there and, and, and there being organisations like that in, in many areas up and down the country, people may not necessarily think to look out to the wider community and to universal services in the third sector because it's all very when it comes to send and and for children with autism and adults with autism everything's very statutory and very yeah. there's these processes that we follow and these people that we have to speak to but actually getting that message across that there are organizations and people like you and your team there to help for free for families up and down the country and i think that's yeah. a really great message today to share with everyone yeah. Oh, I think that I think just one last thing from me on that, and I think this is really important, and I think this is where we make the difference, and I mean the three of us, because I know it's true in this case, but lots of other people, is that we have a very strong ethos of, of employing people with lived experience. So the support staff that I have, and certainly the delivery officers on the Grimsby Full Families project, project, they've either come through one of our projects themselves, or they've been in the situation themselves, that they are now helping others to understand. And that's why I know that this process of allowing people to solve their own problems and then helping people to solve theirs is something that works. So I always look out for if we're gonna be offering uh, support staff around family needs, children need, you need to have somebody who's had kids. You need to have somebody who's been through the system, whether it was a positive or a negative experience. You need to know somebody who's perhaps been out of work and struggled, struggled to find work again, that they found that they came out of work into a world where all of a sudden everything had to be done on a computer, but they'd never had to use one themselves. Those are the people who become the best teachers. Those are the people who become the best advocates because they totally get it. You know, they, they're the ones that have the passion for it because they know what it's like to be on the other side of the, of the story, really. So absolutely, you know, if you've actually battled through, all of us have done it, you know, whether it's, you know, your annual tax return or, or whatever it may be, you know, you get frustrated when things don't seem to work as smoothly as they do. And sometimes just having a friend there, and I think I use the word friend on purpose in that, in that instance, having somebody who's there as a friend to make it easier for you. And we all know that once you've learned something properly, it's much easier to teach somebody else. So that's, that's really what we believe in. Yeah, a lot of the a lot of the people working on this particular project are people with lived, lived experience, and yeah. I think as well, and a lot of people that work in our organisation the same, and it really does make a difference. With that, and I'm really looking forward to our next Q and A with you, Steve, because I know that you're going to be talking to us about one of your employees who is autistic Absolutely. and he's been with you for a very long time, and just talking about from the perspective of an employer, and he's shared some information about his perspective. Yeah coming into you know a social situation in, in, in an organization like yours and what that's looked like so really looking forward to doing that, yeah. that next week or the week after yeah 
Yeah, I'm looking forward to that too. That that was a really interesting uh, video and, and, and to make and, and a fantastic story. And I look forward to sharing that with uh, with your viewers. Yeah, so we'll be we'll we'll be uploading um, this and that video as well. Um, Lovely. Right, and then we'll be talking more about the video um, in regards to that in a couple of weeks. So just thank fantastic. you for your time. It was an honour to speak to you. My pleasure. Have a good day. Take care.